Bismillah, alhamdulillah, we are coming to you right now from here in Kentucky. That's right, we're right in the beautiful state, the state of the rolling hills, the beautiful green grass, and uh, champion horses come out of here, don't they, out of Kentucky, is that right? We're in Louisville, and uh, we're having a pretty good time of it. I understand that today, or was it, is it today that they're going to have the big fireworks? Yeah, tonight? They usually do it at night, right? Yeah. Some countries, though, they have fireworks in the day. They're not very pleasant, though. But a lot of people came here to see these fireworks tonight. This is the time of, big time of the year, I think, for that. We were lucky that we even were able to get a room here. <laughs> so. In fact, we, I, I was told on the way over here that we're, we're actually, we checked out of the hotel. So I don't know what we're gonna do tonight, but <laughs> you live very far from here, you got extra bed. <laughs> okay, I love this hospitality in Kentucky. The food is good, but the hospitality is better. It really is, I've enjoyed being here these couple of days and can't really wait to get back again. So. What we're talking about today, is, this is something very special, what we're doing here. This is called an open mosque, open mosque. And they've opened up this masjid or mosque for the community or anybody who would like to come in, sit down, enjoy a program. I think, we, did, did they tell you about any free food? Did they mention something about food? Yeah. Is there any left? That's all I need to know. <laughs> no, <laughs> he said no. <laughs> okay. And along the way, there, we want to find some common ground for us to share and build, not a new religion, okay? That's not what we're after. Not a conversion, telling people you gotta be Christian or you gotta be a Muslim, but to build a cooperative for the future of the generations to come after us so that they have an environment that gives them the space to be who they want to be. And this is kind of the goal that we're looking for. Not a debate, and of course, if I tried to do a debate with just me here, I'd have to be schizophrenic, but, uh, and we're not really sure about that anyhow. What we want to do, though, is work together to have something that, that really sets a tone not just for here in Louisville, but literally for around the world. Because everywhere I've been in the travels that we've done around the entire world several times, I keep seeing this problem, I'll use that term, that when I'm in the Muslim countries, I hear things being said, being promoted that are not true about us as Americans. And then, of course, here I'm seeing a lot of things being said about Muslims in general, Arabs in particular, that are also not true or exaggerated or twisted. So the only real way to overcome that is for all of us really to have a, a central way to communicate back and forth and say, well, hold on a second. Let's really look and see. Not that I'm challenging the people of the media, whether it be the Foxy networks that are out there. I thought you'd get a kick out of that one. And by the way, we are broadcasting, so uh, we have certain rules and regs from the FCC, and we had to follow that, and we would always do that, you know. Wanted to also make it clear that we're not here to choose a particular political party or lack thereof. It's just that we want to open up some common ground here where everybody has a chance, but keeping within limitations. And one of the things that we use as a criterion for us, believe it or not, we have some things that we share as Muslims, 
with those who are Christians. And that's the reason I pulled this out of the hotel room when I came over here. These are placed by the Gideon Society and, uh, and I'll give it back to the hotel, don't worry about that. But uh, I just thought it would be nice for the Muslims to see, there's the physical evidence in front of us for the translations, but also that a most, I don't know if you know this, but most of the Muslims in the world also, they have the Arabic, don't, don't get me wrong about that, but they don't have the clear meanings. And so whenever somebody doesn't have the clear meanings of their text, and they're relying on translations, there can be some distortion. Is that a nice way to say that? And when we start comparing these things, I hope you'll be able to see some of the things that I've witnessed in the last 25 years, and how not only can we benefit our own selves, but benefit our community at large and really have something to build forward with. This is the concept of what we're pushing for. And I think that the place that we're sitting in is a very excellent example of this. Just a few years ago, this was a church. It had a beautiful big cross right out on the front of it. How many of you remember it? Anybody ever seen it? Yeah? Nice big, huge cross. I know, I looked on Google Maps, and you can go back to 2007, and there it is. There's a picture of it. So this is uh, now a masjid. Uh, by the way, would you like to know what masjid means? It, everything in Arabic has a meaning. So the word masjid is coming from the word sujood or sajda, and it means to prostrate yourself in front of God. So this means that this is a place for prostration to God. That's what it means. By the way, I don't know what church means. I forgot to look that one up. I should have looked that one up. But for sure, you know that a church is a place where people were worshiping God, the God of Adam and Abraham, the God of Moses, the God of David and Suleiman, the God of Yahya. Who knows who's Yahya? Anybody know who that is? Yeah. Anytime you, in Arabic you hear the ya sound, put a J in English, like Yusuf, Joseph. Okay? And Yahya is John, John the Baptist. And Isa, which is Jesus, and Muhammad, peace be upon him, all of them believing in Adam and all those that I just named, and the God of Abraham, the God of Moses, etc. So the building that we're in has that representation already, that it's already felt comfortable. I'm speaking on behalf of the building, which actually doesn't have feelings, but just kind of playing with words. But the building itself has had worship for God from different faiths, still believing in the same God. So this is amazing common ground and literally common ground talking about the building itself. And I think that's a good way to kick off the show. And I think also that this will give us an opportunity to think as we get closer to the end of the, the talk, we want to open up the floor for questions and answers. And very, or, very seldom do we have the opportunity to broadcast the question and answers because we always run out of time. It's always a limited thing. So what we're going to do today, even if we run out of time, we will record the question and answers to be broadcast later. And we say, God willing, and the creeks don't rise. But in Arabic, you say, inshallah. It's a lot easier to say in Arabic. It means God willing, inshallah. All right. Now, we're going to take a short break, and we're going to be right back. And I want to encourage all of us to pray to the one God, and ask him to make this meeting and gathering not just a success for today, but a success for the future, for more and more opportunities to go back and forth and share and get closer to ways to learn and be part of a better community. I mean, stay right there and get guided with Guidus TV. Get connected with Guidus TV. 
Like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash guideustv1. Join us on Google Plus, plus.google.com slash plusguideustv. Follow us on Twitter, twitter.com slash guideustv1. Find us on Flickr, flickr.com slash photos slash guideustv. And add us on LinkedIn, linkedin.com slash guideustv. Get guided with Guide Us TV. A way of life, a way of life, a way of life, a way of life. Islam is a way of life, a complete way. Bismillah, and we are back. We're here in Louisville, Kentucky at the I think it's the Noor Islamic Center, is that right? Huh? Guiding, light. guiding Light. Oh, you, you translated Noor into Guiding Light. I like that. Oh. We're going to be doing a lot of that in our program about translating from Arabic to English. And by the way, if I'm translating it, doesn't mean anything official, okay? It's just something for us to look at and think about. And I'd like to start with a word in the Arabic language to clear up something. The word is God in English, and then another word, Allah in Arabic language. Now just for fun, I'm gonna ask you, and if you want to raise your hand, it's up to you, but how many of you say that the word Allah, this Allah is not the God of the Bible, not the Bible, not the Christian God, not the Jewish God. Raise your hand. If you think it's not. Really? Nobody raised their hand except me? One? Okay, thank you. Actually, the word is not, but the meaning is, absolutely. Why did I say that? Well, first of all, let's, let's find out what the Bible says about the word Allah. Did you know it's in here? In Arabic. Now you're thinking, this guy's cuckoo, right? Arabic doesn't even write the same way. It goes from the right, page, the right side of the page to the left side, and it's a bunch of squiggly lines, and you'd be like, what's he talking about? MashaAllah. See if you can see this. This one, okay. For our folks at home, I want to show them that. Maybe a little later we can edit it and put it up there closer so that they can see it better. They, nobody knew I was going to do this. So they weren't prepared for this. Okay. If you can see the squiggly lines that are right below my fingers, right here. That's Arabic. That is Arabic. There are 26 or 27 languages that they translated John 3.16, for God so loved the world. Okay, the first one on the page is the South African language, Afrikaans language, if you're familiar with that. The second one is Arabic, because they're in alphabetical order. Well, in Arabic, if you know Arabic, you will see that it says, for Allah so loved the world. Alif, lam, lam, ha. So it's right there. So if anybody have a problem with it after that, they should contact the Gideon Society and tell them you didn't translate it right. But then while they're at it, they'd have to go to Beirut, Lebanon, which is one of the big Christian headquarters for translating for the Christians and their Bible, Lebanon. And also in Iraq, there are places where you can get the, what they call Kitab al-Maqdis. Kitab al-Maqdis means literally the Holy Book. And this says Holy Bible, but that's from Kone Greek. Bible is from Biblios, and it just means book. So Holy Book and Holy Book, Kitab al-Maqdis. Why is I'm mentioning that is because on page one, which is Genesis one, page one, 
you'll find the word Allah 17 times on the first page. So if you say, well, it's not the, it's not the God of the Jews, well, if somebody is uh, reading the Old Testament, which is, we called it the Jewish Testament, they're reading Allah, Allah, Allah all the way through it. And whenever any Jews have something in Arabic language, because there are Arab Jews, they say Allah. And throughout Palestine, everybody knows Allah, when, when you're talking about the one Almighty, they all say the same word, Allah. And the word existed so far back that we don't even know what the original time of it appearing. But we know the origin from the linguistics of the language itself. It comes from the word God in Arabic. The word God in Arabic is Elah. That's anything it's worshipped is an Elah. If you said Elah, 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 you're saying God, God, God. If you say uh, Allah, you're saying the name of God, that's his name. But it comes from the word God. But here's some unique things about it. The word God in English can be made plural with a S, gods. And the same is true for Elah, can be made plural in Arabic language. And also in English you can have male or female. Because you say goddess and it means a female goddess, right? And so the same is true of Arabic. The only word that's so unique is the word Allah because it can't be made plural and it can't have gender. In Arabic language, this is known throughout the Arab world that that particular word cannot have gender, male or female, nor can it be made plural. So it seems to fit, doesn't it, for the one God, because if it's only one God, it wouldn't be right if it was a female or a male because you're choosing up sides. <laughs> and it wouldn't be right to say one God, but you could make a plural out of it. So even the reference, and I want to take you back here to the Bible for a second. You'll find in here, sometimes when God is saying in a plural sense, because this is translated from, as we said earlier, Aramaic, then to Greek, and then to in some cases Latin, and then to the English language in this particular one, 1611. So you would be surprised to find this reference to a plural sense of God. Where is that coming from? But when you look at the Quran, you'll find the same thing. Because very often, especially when you read the translation, you'll be like confused. Why does it say we when, when God is speaking? Why does he keep saying we? Is his angels helping him out on stuff? or? Well, it says very clearly that he's only one God, but still, why is he saying we and our and us? Has anybody here been to England? Yeah? And, and you know that Queen Elizabeth and before her, the kings and queens all the way back, whenever they were on the, their throne and they made any kind of a decree, they always say we, right? The famous expression that back in the movie days, they used to say, that the queen is saying, we are not amused, okay? And that meant me, but it's the royal me, the royal I, and the royal us, and the royal all the rest of it. So that's exactly the type of understanding that we have whenever you see something in the Quran, khalakna, we created. It says it real clear in Arabic language. Khalak is create, na at the end means we. Khalakna, we created. And you'd be like, huh? Wow, what are all this thing about monotheism and all of a sudden God is speaking about we are us and so on. So this explains it's something from the language to show the ultimate royalty. There is nothing higher than Almighty God. And we don't say in his creation, there's nothing in the creation higher than God, but we don't ever say he's in the creation because he's not a part of are not to be confused with anything that we can see, hear, touch, smell, feel, sense in any way, shape, or form. There isn't anything in the Creator like unto God. Anything in the creation like unto God. So I hope that helps clear up 
that part of the similarities. Because if you compare what things are being said in the Bible and in the Quran, right away you think, hmm, there, there's something here that we can get along on. I, I, I kind of agree with that. That sounds pretty good. The uh, next thing that I would like to do is move to some commandments. Because once somebody believes in God, and maybe I should stop long enough to do this to find out, is there anybody here that doesn't believe in God at all? Anybody? One? Only? Okay. So if somebody doesn't believe in God or a deity uh, in any way, shape, or form, so they might feel like they're being excluded from the human race according to the people who are religious. According to the Bible and to the Quran, it acknowledges that everybody exists. It doesn't say they don't exist, that they're not there. No, it does, as a matter of fact. But there's another area that needs to be cleared up, I think, because I've seen some t-shirts or sweatshirts that are on sale, that in, especially in Europe, that people are wearing in a, in a way, as I was hearing from Tim Howard last night, was telling us that it's a defiant uh, stroke, like speaking out against Muslims. Like if there's gonna be a protest about something, some Muslims are there, so somebody else wants to come and they wanna protest, so they'll put on these shirts that have this word, infidel. Now, to us over here, we're going, why would you do that? That, that sounds strange. Why would, you, why would you call yourself an infidel? A, a Christian, why would you call yourself an infidel? Well, it's because the translators, and, and I'm always harping about this subject, the translators 200 years ago translated a word, kafir, as infidel to English. And people have been relying on that right along. But come to find out, you can go to the dictionary in English, and obviously most of you already know what it means, but when you go to the Arabic, you'll be surprised to find out that the word kafir is not anything connected to infidel. And when we come back, we'll be talking about that. So stay right there, and we'll find out how these words have an impact on us around the world. Stay right there, and get guided with Guided TV. MashaAllah, newly converted Muslims, MashaAllah, MashaAllah. Oh, I love this. And you can watch it anytime if you just get the apps, the free apps for iPhones, iPads, also the smartphones. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. The smartphones and the Android phones, you'll be able to do it real easy, and it is free, and you can watch it anytime. Wa alaikum salam. We're about ready to give some more shahadas, and you can join us. You can also help donate. Donate online at guideus.tv. Yeah, guideus.tv slash donate. Allah Akbar. And you can be helping these people get to Islam, too. Ah, Allah Akbar. Allah gives the hidayah. He guides the people with Guide Us TV. A way of life, a way of life, a way of life, a way of life. Islam is a way of life, a complete way. Okay, and we're back. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. I'd like to start out with Bismillah. Let's talk about the very first, first words in the Quran today, Arabic language. It says, Bismi. Allah, Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim. That's the very first line, and it's also the first line of every single chapter, except one, chapter nine. And it is a very good way to introduce what you're reading of the Quran, because it said Bismi. Now, Bismi is translated as in the name, in the name. Then it says Allah, in the name of Allah. There's a reason why the translators use that. Because again, with reference to royalty, Bismillah 
wouldn't sound right if you literally translated it because it means with the name. But when we're talking about somebody coming with a message from the king or the queen, it will say, in the name of the king, the name of the queen, the name of Caesar, the name of whatever. So they say, in the name. It's not a big deal. It's really different. In Arabic, it's with the name, all right? Because bi means with, and fi means in in Arabic. So this little small thing and not anything really to worry about. But the next part of it is Ar-Rahman Rahim. Ar-Rahman is from a root, Rahama. And Rahim is from the same exact root, Rahama. The first one, Rahma, Rahman is from Rahma. This is a general term of general mercy, an all-encompassing general mercy for every part of the creation. So if you said, God has mercy or benevolence for his, or graciousness for his whole entire creation, then you would use the word Rahman. Rahman means he's the epitome of that word Rahma. Okay, am I boring you yet? All right. Rahim is specific, exact, as though instead of saying, like this with my hand and saying, all of y'all come on over. I say, you come on over and we're gonna have a good time tonight. We're gonna sit down and, and eat some munchies and watch some late night TV. And, but I'm just talking to you, see? I'm being specific. And so this Rahim is specific and Rahma is general. So we say, Ar-Rahman, Ar-Irahim. Yeah, there's connectors in there that if you continue, you put them in, kind of like a contraction. Like, don't is a contraction of do not. So when you say Bismillah, Rahman, Rahim, you run it all together, it sounds really pretty like that, okay? Now, you might be interested to know a couple of things about this. And I'll go to the specific first and then the general afterwards. The specific is specifically for women. In the English language, the place that she conceives a child within her body is called a womb. This is a clinical term for the place where a woman has the first starting of the zygote when it, it attaches to the you know, inside of her and it punctures a hole and it begins to start and that little tiny microscopic egg starts becoming a human being. That place is called a womb. No particular meaning. But in the Arabic language, and this goes way back before we have recorded history, it was always called the Raham. The Raham. Raham, this is a place of mercy. So according to the Arabic language and Islam, we were all created in the place of mercy by the merciful God. And that's a very beautiful thing. Now I want to tell you a little something else about this. That in the case of the words themselves, our Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he explained something about this mercy. He said, he actually he asked his companions about a lady who had a newborn baby. She had this newborn baby with her. He said, would this lady let her baby fall into a fire? And they said, oh, no. No, there's no way. No mother would ever do that. He said, you're right. This is from the mercy of God that all mothers have this compassion for their children. This is something innate, something that comes automatically with being a mother, and it's from God's mercy, from his Rahma. Then look what he said. He said that this is throughout the universe. This word Rahma is for the whole universe from the time of the beginning until the very end of time. It's from God's Rahma. He said, but God has 100 parts of Rahma, and this is only one of them. On the day of judgment, the other 99 parts, Rahim, is waiting for the true believers. Now, this is much more encompassing than a lot of the Muslims will give credit to today. A lot of Muslims I've talked to in different countries are very narrow in saying that, you know, it not only not only is it only Islam that can go to paradise, 
but only people from our understanding of it. And then they get even more narrow in some cases and go off on a tangent. But without getting too deep into that, just to let you know that Americans are not the only one that can get radical. <laughs> Anybody can get radical. However, let us look to what the content of the Quran tells us about that. It says, and this is a verse that I was taught by one of our scholars from Pakistan. He studied in Medina in Saudi Arabia for a number of years. And he learned perfect Arabic. He speaks perfect Urdu, perfect Arabic. And the one thing he missed was English. So when I met him, he couldn't say a single word of English. But over the years, he learned and he got really good at it. So one of the things he started from the very beginning teaching us though. There's a verse in chapter 3 of the Quran, it's verse number 110, that many, many people only quote you the first part of it. They don't give you the second part of the verse. And I don't know if it's, I don't think it's by intent. I think they're just trying to get the first part across. But I, I'd like you to check this out. I have a website that you can find a lot of the material that I'm covering, but a lot more that I'm not. It's called Share Islam, S-H-A-R-E-I-S-L-A-M.com, shareislam.com, and it actually takes you, uh, or gives portals, beautiful pictures, and then suggests the topic, 10 topics, and when you click, it'll take you into 10 separate websites that are designed to give you the questions that you probably would have or heard other people have. Then you click it, it gives you the answer in English. It took us about 10 years to put all of that together, along with about 2,900 2, other websites, 2,922 2, websites. But these are the ones that have the most impact for our topic today, so that's why it's like that. Now, in this surah or chapter of the Quran, chapter 3, verse 110, and I'll give you the Arabic first, <clears throat> inshallah. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم كنتن خير أمتن أقرجت للناس تأمرون بالمعروف وتنهون عن المنكر وتؤمنون بالله ولو أمانا أخو الكتاب لا كان خير لهم منهم المؤمنون وأكثرهم الفاسقون. The first part of it is addressing true believers because it says you are the best of people raised up. You're the best nation uh, raised up for the people because you call to al-maruf, you forbid al-munkar, and you believe in Allah. I left two words in Arabic on purpose because the translators use the word you call the good and you forbid evil. When we questioned one of the scholars about it, he said that's not a good translation. He said, how are you translating maruf and munkar? I said good and evil. He said in this case it's not correct. When the usage here, it refers to something much bigger because you never have anything that comes before your belief in God. Nothing comes before your belief in God in Islam, nothing. So why does it say you call the good, forbid evil, and you believe in God? Even in the Arabic language, it's clear that you put these predicated here. What is that? And no action, mu'amala is action, is ever acceptable if it isn't for the sake of God. You, you can't uh, rob a bank, for instance, for the sake of God or something like that, or you can't, so your intention has to be correct. There's a lot of things about this. Well, this gets really interesting when you consider that this is the only place in the Quran you find these things coming ahead of the belief. Everywhere else it says, alladina amanu wa amilu salihat those people who have the right belief and they do the deeds of righteousness. So what the Sheikh was telling us, if you understood Maruf and Munkar properly, you wouldn't have this problem. He said it is to call to Almighty God. It's not just calling to good because there's no good in this universe if it's not coming from God. So it's the ultimate call to Almighty God. And second of all, the munkar is the ultimate evil, which is to make people lose all faith, and they don't have anything to hope for, nothing to believe in, no belief or calling them away from the belief in the one true God. 
So it means you will stand up for and encourage people to know more about who God is, help them to get better connected, if you will, and then at the same time, stop things that take people away from this beautiful and wonderful feeling and expression and spirituality of believing in Almighty God, okay? He said, and this is how he summed it up, if you're not willing to call to the Lord and you're not willing to forbid what takes people away from the Lord, then how could you say you believe in the Lord? How could you say you believe in him if you're not willing to do anything about it? That was his point. And it, it, it really hit well with us, and it stuck in my mind even till today as being very important. Now we come to the second part. The rest of it says, that's not the end of it. The rest of it says, and if the people of the book, there's two testaments in here. We call it the Old and the New Testament, or the Torah and the Gospel. The Quran says, Wallahu amana ahu kitab. Kitab means book. Aho means people of. And if the people of the book had believed, it would be better for them. From them, men whom, men means from, men whom from them are believers. Present tense of the verb. Men whom, there are believers even today from the people of the book believing in God. Wa and Akhtarahum, most of them, Fasik, are Fasik. It doesn't say Kafir, it doesn't say infidel. And now we're gonna come back to that in a minute. So, what does Fasik mean? It means disobedient, corruptors, twisting things around, pretending, like we might even, uh, it doesn't say, in Arabic is uh, nifaq, which means hypocrisy. It doesn't use that word, but it could lead to hypocrisy. And if you doubt what I just said, you think about what Jesus said himself in Matthew 5, 17 and 18, when he was telling the people, don't think I came to destroy the law and the prophets. I came not to destroy, but rather to fulfill. And not until all things be accomplished, Shall a single dot, jot, tittle, iota, depending on which translation you have, will be in any wise lessened. And whoever breaks the least commandment and teaches this, he will be the least in the kingdom. But whoever keeps the commandments and teaches this, he'll be the highest in the kingdom. And unless your righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees, you will in no wise enter the kingdom. And the Pharisees were the hypocrites to them at that time. So we can see that there's a clear parallel with this, talking about hypocrisy, even amongst the own, and Pharisees were supposed to be the leaders of the religion too, if you remember. So just because somebody's wearing a, a cool looking outfit and got some kind of paraphernalia running around. And by the way, I got a bunch of that stuff in my closet too. And it's a white things and long things. And, and on Fridays when we do the sermons, I'll put different things on, but it doesn't mean anything. The clothes don't make the man. In Islam, it's the heart. And it's all about the heart. And you can't see my heart, I can't see your heart. So none of us really knows who are the believers. Well, somebody might be fooling us and acting really righteous. Somebody else might be doing a lot of bad stuff, mistakes, and like, ah, oh, there's no way this guy could go to paradise. And God, he doesn't like that because he's the one who knows the hearts. And he is very clear about telling us that we shouldn't judge each other. He even says it in one of the most famous of the chapters of the Quran at the end of it, alay salahu bi kamil hakimin, isn't Allah the best of judges? And so all Muslims are being reminded this thing again and again. Now I want to come to that word that I promised you. The word kafir and the word infidel. They're not, they should not never be put together because it, it's not correct. But what do they both mean and how do we understand them? I want to do part of this for the Muslims that are here too as well. 
to be sure that they don't misunderstand. Someone who is a kafir does not mean that they're literally a disbeliever because it's not related to the same word. From what I have explained today, I've tried my best to give a fair representation of both Christianity, Judaism, and Islam, whichever I've touched on the least or most, notwithstanding. But if I said that this is a book that all, all the monotheistic religion, Abrahamic faith, look at and have high respect for, which is true, by the way, Muslims are not allowed by any way, shape, or form to ever handle this book in an improper way. We cannot. Even you said, well, it's a translation. Uh, we have translations of Quran too, but we still respect them. And even if you said, well, yeah, but uh, there's stuff in here that contradicts the Quran. It doesn't matter. It still represents what was originally there before, so we have to have respect. Just like you can have respect for a person and still you don't agree with everything they say, but you still respect them. So if I said all of this, and then I leave, and somebody else come in and they said, no, he didn't say that. No, he didn't mean that. He said, he said, blah, 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 blah. You know, like a news commentator. I just thought I'd sneak that in there. <laughs> that person is making infidelity, isn't, aren't they? They're not trustworthy. Because the word fidelity means trustworthy. Then a lot of uh, financial institutions use that word in their name, don't they? It means trustworthy. Trust me, give me your money. <laughs> That's why they call it fidelity. You're supposed to get all excited about that. But infidelity means somebody who is not true. Infidelity is something that a person can get a divorce over just like that in a lot of states, is that right? Promiscuous, adulterous. So it's a really bad word, isn't it? And it's very clear that this person is not trustworthy, not honest, and so on. The word kafir has a whole different thing. And what's interesting in the Quran, Allah, God Almighty, tells us that he does kafara from the same root, kafara. Huh? Yes. If you make tawbah, which means to repent to God, you repent to God sincerely in your heart, and you say, you know what? God, I'm sorry for everything I've ever done. I, I beg you to please forgive me. That's called repentance or tawbah. And when somebody does that sincerely, then God does forgive them. And then he covers up their sins. He doesn't always like remove them, but he'll make it so that nobody can see them. As long as you don't ever mention those to other people, then good to go. So we don't, as Muslims, we don't have this thing where people stand up and say, you know, I used to drink this and I used to go over there and that lady over there. No, 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 no. no. This is not true confessions. That's not Islam at all. What you've done, you've made a mistake, you repent for that to your Lord and you don't ever do it again. This is what we're being taught because then it's going to be covered up, kafara. So that is, watch this. See this cup right here? I covered it up, right? That's an act of kufr. Literally, from the word. It has nothing to do with religion now. We're just talking about words. Do you know who the real kafir was before Islam came? In the Arabic language, somebody was kafir. You know what it means? He's a farmer. A farmer. You say, what? Yes, because it's the act of digging the ground, putting the seeds in, and then covering up. So it's somebody who covers the truth that's known to them. They know that this is the natural inclination, but they covered it up anyway. That is the intent when it's being used in the religion. A person who knows, but he covers. 
So this automatically makes most of the non-Muslims innocent, at least of that, because they haven't ever known what the truth was. Now, by the way, you're not going to have that excuse, inshallah, when you go out the door, because I'm going to do my best to be sure that you do know the truth. And then it'll be up to you what you want to do with that. But for sure, at least know what the truth is. And then you can say, I choose not to do that. That's your choice. But at least you will get a chance to know what it's about. And that is the whole purpose of the mission that myself and the brothers that work with me and sisters that work with me, this is what we're trying to do across the country with our TV channel. And speaking of the channel, I'm being told we gotta take a quick break. We'll be right back after this. Don't go away, because we've got something real special for you to see, and then we'll be right back with more to get guided with Guidance TV. Here are some ways to get Guidance TV via satellite on Galaxy 19 FTA. At this satellite frequency, transponder rate 5, frequency 11836 MHz, polarity vertical, symbol rate 20770, FEC 3 quarters, channel ID Guide US TV. You can also download the app to your smartphone. Available for iPhones from the App Store. For Android on Google Play. And now Guide Us TV is available on Roku. Get guided with Guide Us TV. A way of life, a way of life, a way of life, a way of life. Islam is a way of life, a complete way. Bismillah, in the name of Allah, Rahman Rahim, most gracious, the most merciful. We are back and we've been talking about the open mosque here in Louisville, Kentucky. And I've seen something amazing here today. I just want to make a comment for our audience. And that is, we, we had an idea, open mosque and open minds, but I'm seeing open hearts. And I love that. I've, since I've been here, just less than 48 hours, I've had a chance to go in some of the restaurants. Uh, my, my places are like Denny's and IHOP, you know, that's what I like. But, and meeting with people in the hotels and so on, I've been really pleasantly surprised at the, how, because you see I'm dressed with this long thing on and the beard and all that. Of course, maybe they don't know I'm a Muslim. Maybe they think I'm Santa Claus on vacation or something. I don't know. But anyway, I've been had, had some really good greetings and salutations along the way. It's nice. I was talking earlier about the Holy Bible. I only brought it up here because I wanted to show you that word out of it and let you know about the respect that we have as Muslims for it. I would like, if you don't mind, for me to share a little something about the name of the guiding light that you see out here. What is that all about? To a Muslim, that word guidance is critical. This is a very critical uh, understanding for us. Because in the very beginning of the Quran, there are seven verses that are repeated 17 times a day, every single day of our lives, in Arabic language. 88%, this, this is a, a statistic that I'm not positive it's 89 or 88, but that's pretty close, of all the Muslims in the world are not Arabs. They're not Arabs. And don't know how to really speak in Arabic language except for the Quran. And there are some who are not Arab, they're experts with the Arabic language, and there are some Arabs <laughs> I'm not doing too good with the Arabic language. So, just so you get an idea. Now, it's interesting that we have this one key word, and I'd like to share it with you. It took me a second or two here to do it, but here's the first and the beginning of the Quran, seven verses. It's very, very powerful. It has a big impact. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين 
الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين إدينا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين نعمت عليهم غير المكذوب عليهم ولا المالين. If we're in prayer, we say Amin after that. That's how critical this is. We actually say Amin in our prayers after we say this. Those seven verses are the heart of the Quran. These seven verses have been recited even people not Muslim have heard these verses, didn't even know what it was, and still felt something. Because these are not human words. These are words coming from Almighty God to the last prophet that he sent to us to convey a message to the people. There really is a God. He really is merciful. And let's listen to the translation of what this says. In the name of Almighty Allah, the most gracious, the most merciful, all the praise, thanksgiving, and worship is for Allah. Alhamd means so much. Alhamdulillah, all the praise and thanksgiving to Allah. Rabbil Alameen, the Lord of the worlds, plural. Plural. Lord of the worlds, not just human beings, but all the worlds. Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, he's repeating that he is the generally merciful and specifically merciful. Maliki Yawm din Malik is king, the king or ruler on the day of judgment. Iyaka na'budu wa iyaka nasta'in. You only do we worship. And you only do we turn to for our guidance. Ihdi means guide me. Ihdina means guide us. Idina sirat, the way, the way, mustaqim, straight, straight way. The adjectives come after the nouns, like Spanish. Serato mustaqim. Then, you were saying, guide us to the straight path. Then look what comes next. The path of those who have your favors. We want to be on the path of those that God has given favor to. Well, that makes sense. I'm asking for that. Yeah, that's what I'm saying that I mean at the end. But then there are two statements that come after that. Gairo, Gairo. That sounds kind of harsh, doesn't it? It is harsh. It says, no way, Jose, uh-uh. Gairo Magdubi, not the ones that have your wrath. What a Dalin or those that are lost. Dalala means lost. Can't find your way. You're in the dark, you're lost. You're, so you need, this is why it says guiding light. So being lost in the dark versus guiding light, that's the sign out front. And that's what we're all about. Uh, by the way, it's time for a plug for the channel, right? <laughs> Guide Us TV, because this again, this is what it's all about, guidance. Now that I've explained that to you, I'm telling you at the same time to not judge Christianity based on what some politicians who claim to be Christians might do. That's a fair statement, right? I would, ask, I would ask anybody, please do not judge Christianity based on what one or two presidents might have done. And I won't go further than that. I won't even mention what state they came from. <laughs> but we all know, right? So, okay. But don't say that's Christianity because it's against that. Christianity is against those things that these people have done, whether they're corruptors or whether they're, you know, whatever they do. I'm, no sense giving you any more about that than you have to be inundated with from the television anyway. 
I would also like to mention that let's don't judge Judaism based on what some people who claim to be from the Jewish faith. Because all of us, we can read the Bible. There's one sitting here, if you doubt what I said, and you will find some things even from the prophet's own offspring that were some pretty wild and bloodthirsty things that they did. In the story of Yusuf, who I'm named after in the Bible, Joseph, you know, he's the one that was put in the well. How many of you know the story I'm talking about? Yeah, Joseph was put in the well. This same story is more detailed in the Quran. And it doesn't leave the subject. In the middle of the Genesis, when it talks about Yusuf or Joseph, in the middle of the story, it stops and tells you about the rape of Dinah, and then it comes back telling you about Yusuf again. But that's not the case in the Quran. It stays with the story all the way through. But my mention of it is the rape of Dinah, which is mentioned there. If you've read that, you understand what happened. And the retribution that the sons of Jacob took on these people, not only slaughtering them, but even sowing salt into the earth itself so nothing could grow there anymore. Anybody remember the story? Yeah. It's pretty wild. But I would say that just like, and it said Jacob was displeased with them for that. So obviously, you couldn't take that and say that Judaism is teaching it's okay to go out here and promise people if you come to my religion, which is what they did, if you come to our religion, then you can keep her as uh, your wife, because that's she and the son of Hakam, what was his name? I forgot it now. Anyway, that they could um, get along. The chief tribe's son had Dinah, their girl, etc. What happens in this story is that they said, well, you can't become Jewish because you're not circumcised. So the men all agreed, 200,000, I think the Bible said, all these men circumcised themselves. Ouch. Then it said on the third day, when they were sore, S-O-R-E, and I would imagine that they could hardly defend themselves. So that's when the sons of Jacob and their tribes went in and slaughtered them, slaughtered all the men, kill all the men, don't leave a man alive, kill all the women except the ones that you like for yourself and the little boys that you want to turn into slaves. This is in the Bible. I'm not, uh, this is not something I made up from TV. It's in there. Now, we wouldn't be able to say that that's something that's being taught by Judaism, nor, and I want to end with this, nor would it be fair to say what a few of the two billion Muslims of the world, a few of them are doing in the name of their religion. It just isn't fair to say that, take a paintbrush and say, well, all Muslims are this, or all Christians are that, or all Jews are so and so. In fact, we are all human beings. We're all descendants from Adam. We're all brothers and sisters in the flesh. And some of us are more brothers and sisters in faith than we might even know. I'll wrap it up with that. And I ask the one almighty God to accept from us and bring our hearts closer together for his sake and to give us a positive aspect on how we can move forward in the future here and in the hereafter. And until next time we can be together, always get guided with Guide Us TV. Assalamu alaikum.